Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Preventing and Resolving Common Space Utilization Issues in NetApp Cluster Data on Tap, brought to you by Datalink. My name is Danielle Moore, Marketing Manager at Datalink, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenter. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized and you can resize or move any of the windows that you have open. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. All questions from this webcast will be captured. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the question mark icon below the presentation window. The help guide covers common technical issues. I would now like to turn this presentation to our presenter, Josh Morrison. Josh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Morrison. I am a technical support engineer here at Datalink. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us on our Tech Tuesday. Um, this afternoon, I am going to go over some of the common problems that we in Datalink support see around space utilization in Clustered on Tap. Uh, the goal is to enable you to identify and correct some of, the, some of these issues on your own, as well as to prevent or provide some tips around minimizing the chances that they occur. Uh, the first issue uh, that I was going to discuss is that when a user is unable to write to a volume, um, that's showing available space. Uh, here we have a, an end user has called in stating that they were attempting to copy a file to their share. However, an error has come up indicating that there's not enough space. Uh, from Windows Explorer, we see that there's plenty of space, as well from the error message itself saying, uh, showing the space free value, appears to have enough room to contain the file. Uh, this behavior is indicative of an out of inodes issue on the volume. Um, this can be verified reviewing the event log show output uh, from the command line. Um, here you will see indi uh, notices indicating that the volume SIFS is out of inodes. Um, when this volume enters an out of inode state, it's also going to trigger a phone home or an auto support as we call it. Um, and if you have these configured to come to your email, you'll get these as well. Um, Datalink will receive these notes and will notify you of these out of inodes events. Um, if you also see in this uh, note here that there is a warning um, as we hit these out, uh, uh, as we get closer um, to a watermark, 80% um, will start showing warnings that for that same volume. Um, so just some things that you can see in the event log that will give you some idea that this may be coming up. Um, okay, so what is an inode? Uh, NetApp states an inode is a data structure that defines a file except for the file except for the file name, which is stored in a directory entry. Note that a directory is just another file. So the inode number is an integer unique to the volume upon which it is stored. Inodes point to blocks that make up a file, and inodes also contain the metadata of the file. Uh, by default, NetApp volume contains one inode per 32 KB of data, and this can be increased as high as one inode per 4 KB of data. Um, be aware that there are potential performance issues as the system hits the maximum inode count. Um, and the point that that performance impact is going to vary by a system configuration, such as your controller model, um, aggregate size, volume size. Um, I will let you know that as I was attempting to recreate the issue in my own lab here, um, as I was writing data to this volume, it was going very fast at, at the beginning, and, and it was noticeably slower to perform these writes as, uh, as the inode table filled up. So how do we determine which volume is affected? Uh, to find out which volume is affected, we go back to the event log show output. The following line will state that the volume, the volume name and the UUID of the storage virtual machine. We determine the name of the storage virtual machine, the, the, uh, the user-friendly name, uh, by running the vServer show command with the UUID. Uh, this is useful if you've received the alert and the environment, and you know, some environments will have uh, same, similar name volumes spread across multiple V servers. So this will allow you to determine which V server is uh, containing the volume you're looking for. So how do we correct this? Um, we have two methods uh, to increase the amount of inodes in a volume. 
Um, we can either grow the volume as new inodes will be created when the space is added, or we can grow the available number of inodes with the volume modify command. Uh, the current recommendation is to grow the volume only if the volume is over 80% full. Um, otherwise, we should just increase the inode count. Um, so in the first instance here, our volume is over 80% 80, 80 full, so we decided to grow the volume. This can be done from either on command or from the CLI. Um, I wanted to show you CLI here so we can verify the inode count before and after the growth. Uh, using the df-i command, we can see the amount of inodes used. Now we are free both before and after growing the volume. Um, so we can see the inodes used hasn't changed, but the inodes free has increased um, as we grew it from 10 gigs to 12 gigs here. If the volume is not over 80% utilization, we're going to increase the inode table itself. So to do this, first we need to determine the current amount of inodes that are being used. The df-i command again will show you the number of inodes used for the volume. Um, this information can also be gathered using the volume show command with the uh, dash field flag uh, and the files option. So you'll see that the inodes used is equal to the value for the files here, as we're at 100%. Um, the field flag lets you customize the output from the command you've run. Um, and this is just, a, just an easy way to get that particular piece of data. Um, it's very important to know that you can never shrink the inode table. Um, and due to the potential performance issues mentioned previously, the recommendation is to only grow the inode table 2% at a time. So when we grow, to grow the inode table, we take our current value and multiply it by 1.02 uh, to get our new value. Uh, we can use this value with the mod volume modify command, specifying our vServer and volume, and using the files flag. You see a note indicating, you'll see a note that there's a, the volume modify was successful. Um, if you do receive an error running this command, it's possible that you have reached the maximum amount of inodes for a given volume, which would be Again, more than one per 4K. Uh, and ONTAP will not let you raise it past this point. Um, if you see this case, you can revert to a volume grow method to increase the inode table. Um, at that point, it might be worth you know, considering uh, maybe restructuring data or looking to place the data on a new volume. Uh, so how do we minimize the risk of these types of events? Um, out of inode events are primarily caused by large amounts of small files in a single volume. Um, so having an understanding of the type of data and sizing the volume in inode table when it's created will help to minimize these types of risk. So the second issue I wanted to discuss was uh, when a volume displays a space available mismatch, um, and this will be in SIFs in particular. So. <coughs> We have, in this instance, we have a user calling in stating that their SIS volume is showing at 84% utilization and only 1.8 or 1.78 gigs free. However, knowing that the data involved in this volume is only four gigs, um, and they're curious as to where this additional space has gone. Um, so to begin, I just wanted to define some of the different terms that on command system Android uses for the space tab. So when you're viewing the volumes, um, we have three different boxes here. We have the volume, we have the available, and the used. Um, so we have total data space, which is the total, uh, the volume space configured for the user data. Uh, we have snapshot reserve. It's the volume space configured for system snapshots. Uh, the data space, which is the volume space that is consumed by user data. We have snapshot copy space, which is the data, uh, volume space that is consumed by snapshots. We have the snapshot overflow space. This is the volume space that is consumed by snapshots that exceeds the snapshot reserve and is encroaching on the user data space. It's also referred to as snapshot spill. Um, in the available, we have data space, which is the volume space that is currently available for user data. And we have snapshot reserve. It's, this is the volume space that is currently available for snapshots before they overflow. So here's, um, <clears throat> so on the bottom left we see from Windows Explorer that we have 1.77 gigs free of 8.79. Um, above that, we see the space allocation tab for the same volume in System Manager. What we see here from the use space is that the data space is using four gigs, as we have previously, previously seen from the user's incident. 
we also see that there's about five gigs of snapshot in the same volume. These snapshots are larger than our snapshot reserve and are overflowing into the user data space, which is causing what we're viewing here. Um, from the CLI, we see that the volume show space command uh, to view the same information. Uh, here, snapshot overflow is referred to as snapshot spill. So snapshot overflow and snapshot spill are the same if you're looking at the CLI versus the GUI. We can also verify a space being utilized on the right with the snapshot copies tab. The cumulative total size for our snapshots here we're seeing is approximately 5.18 gigs. Um, the left-hand left slide shows the snapshot copies configure window, which will allow us to alter the snapshot reserve percentage. So on this slide, I've reduced the snapshot reserve from 20% to 5% to show you how this affects the total uh, total data space and the snapshot fill, spill value. Um, we see that the data space has gone from 8.79 to 10.4 gigs, um, but we're still seeing the available space is still 1.77 uh, as our snapshot spill has gone up. You also see the available data space has not changed. Uh, from Windows Explorer, we also see the same information. Um, so I've now gone and cleared out all of my snapshots from this volume. Obviously, this is just a, not necessarily something that you'd necessarily do in your production environment, but if you need to clear out snapshots, it is an option. Um, but we can see that with the snapshot reserve at 5%, the same data and no snapshots, um, our available space is now 6.4 gig free, and we can see that in the disk space and from Windows Explorer. So how do we prevent snapshot spill? Uh, the best way to, is to understand the data that is being placed on your volume. Knowing the rate of change and lifespan of the data will allow you to minimize snapshot spill. If this is something that was caused by a one-time event, such as a large delete or write operation that caused um, that can potentially have caused the utilization to grow. Um, in that case, you maybe just need to understand that the lifespan of that snapshot, when, it, when the snapshot expires, um, it will roll off and your space will be reclaimed back to your volume. Uh, the third issue that we frequently see is when attempting to delete snapshots, um, somebody's unable to delete a snapshot to free up space in their volume. Um, the problem is, as an administrator, you're attempting to delete a snapshot. However, the delete option is grayed out, and there's an application dependency on the volume. Here we see it's a busy B clone state. And again, I just wanted to show, um, on the left side, we have our snapshot copies tab for the volume sifts. Uh, we see the highlighted snapshot in the bottom states busy V clone. And on the right, we have the snapshot show output command for the same volume, utilizing the fields flag to customize our output, which indicates the snapshot is in a volume cloned state. Um, this indicates, indicates that the snapshot is currently being tied up by a flex clone volume. So how do we relate the snapshot to the cloned volume? So from the CLI, we can use the volume clone show command to get a list of all of our current clones and the snapshots that back them. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can see that this daily 216.719 underscore 0010 snapshot is the snapshot that was in busy V clone. And it also tied to the sifs underscore clone uh, with the date stamp of when the clone was created. And if we attempt to delete the snapshot from the CLI, we'll also get an error that will indicate which clone volume is using the snapshot. So how do we release the snapshot? So there's, we have a couple of options here. We can either perform a clone split, or we can offline and delete the clone volume. Uh, the flex clone may be out there for many reasons, such as test dev, restoration, or backup verification from one of our SnapManager products. Um, 
if there's enough space in the aggregate and you still need to keep the clone volume, then you want to perform the split. Otherwise, if the business no longer needs the clone, you can offline and delete the volume. <clears throat> in the first instance, we've determined that we need to keep the clone for our development team. From System Manager, we highlight the clone volume and select the split option from the clone dropdown. It acknowledges command and select start split. On, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we can see the CLI commands for the same option. Um, we're going to run the volume clone split estimate command. Um, this will give you an idea of how much extra space that this clone split operation will take in your aggregate uh, prior to actually executing the clone split. Um, once we've done that, we can use the clone split start, which will kick off the process. Um, and then we can monitor the process with, that, with the volume clone split status. In the second instance, we've determined that the clone volume was left over from a restore operation a previous administrator had done that was no longer needed. Uh, in this case, we will go through the offline destroy operation. Starting on the left, we go into namespace and unmount the volume. Um, from there, the volume so, uh, section where we can offline the clone volume. And then we can finally delete the volume. Um, from the CLI, uh, we have the ability to just do a volume offline, which will also uh, unmount from the namespace in the same step. And then we can delete the volume. <clears throat> if you're not sure if the volume can be deleted uh, or if you know, you've determined that it looks like it's not yet necessary. Um, you can offline it and leave it offline for a 24-hour period is usually what I would recommend um, before deleting it. Uh, but again, it depends on the urgency as to how long to leave that out there before you delete it to go ahead and delete the clone. <clears throat> so now we can verify that the snapshot is no longer busy. On the left from System Manager, we see that there's no longer an application dependency and our delete options not grayed out. On the right, I've actually executed the snap delete command. Um, snapshot show command to show that we're able to delete the snapshot and it's no longer visible in the system. So how do we minimize busy snapshots? Um, so remove manually created flex clones once they're no longer needed. Um, if you know a flex clone is going to be used for some long-term testing, um, consider splitting the clone before the snapshot would expire. Um, you, may, you may leave it out there initially, and then once you determine that it's long-term, you can split it at any time um, before that would expire. Um, if you do have Snap Manager, job, Snap Manager jobs running, um, this is one place where we see some busy V clones where administrators aren't quite sure where they came from. Um, Snap Manager can, will perform verification jobs, which mounts up uh, the file system as a flex clone to do the verify. Um, and if these fail for whatever reason, um, they may not get unmounted and cleaned up properly. Um, so if you just mo uh, monitor um, Snap Manager for failures, just make sure that the flex clones are being cleaned up. Um, and that'll help remove some of those busy snapshot instances. <clears throat> um, so the final issue I just wanted to discuss uh, was a guest OS has lost access to a NetApp One unexpectedly. So in this instance, our Exchange services are off offline. Um, the drive containing the Exchange database is missing from Windows Explorer. Other drives from the same NetApp device are still visible to Exchange in this instance. Uh, and the Windows system event log indicates that there are disk errors. From the event log show output, uh, we'll see alerts indicating that there's a waffle vol full uh, with insufficient space in the volume, followed by a, a waffle write failure and a one offline. Um, this indicates that the NetApp did not have enough space in the volume to guarantee their rights to the one, and it took the one offline. So please note that this is by design. Um, it's done to protect your data from becoming corrupted. Um, this is due to a volume, basically this is due to a volume full uh, in instance where this one is contained. The one itself uh, may still have available space, so you'll want to watch it from the storage side rather than the guest side. <clears throat> so again, this is showing um, from System Manager, we can still see the volumes online. Um, however, it's out of space. 
we see the LUN still has available space in it. And we can see that the LUN is offline from the command line while the volume is, is still online. At this point, we can attempt to online that LUN. Um, however, if we haven't cleared up the space issue, attempts to online the LUN will, they won't fail, but they won't give you any feedback. So it doesn't indicate it fails, it doesn't indicate it's success. It just comes back with a blank line. But if you go and do a LUN show after that, we'll still see that that LUN is offline. <clears throat> okay, so how do, we, uh, how do we correct that? Um, at this point, we have uh, two options, really. It's either delete snapshots from the volume to free up space, um, or we can grow the volume to increase the available space. Um, the method really depends upon the needs of the business, uh, requirements around snapshot retention for your data. Um, if you're using Snap Manager products, um, ha allowing them to manually delete their own snapshots is preferable to delete, deleting them from the system because um, otherwise you'll have to go and do some cleanup around Snap Manager products. Um, so once you've freed up space using one of these methods, you can online the one from uh, on command or the command line, and then execute uh, a rescan from the OS to bring the, the disk back online. And here um, we're just showing that, again, that the volume's online after we've freed up space, and the one was able to be brought back online. So how do we minimize the risk of one offline events? Um, we have a couple of options that NetApp has provided. Uh, we have auto-grow and auto-delete. Um, <clears throat> so these can be configured from the advanced tab on the edit volume screen. Um, you can configure it to automatically grow and automatically delete. Uh, the auto-grow allows us to define the maximum size to allow the volume to grow as well as how, how large of increments that it grows each time it does. Um, and again, ensuring that you have the volume size properly to control, contain both the LUN and snapshot delta for your volume. So minimizing space-related issues um, really comes down to knowing the data that lives on your volume. Um, knowing the life cycle and the types of data is going to allow you to properly size and configure your volumes. Um, if you do need assistance going through volume sizing exercises, uh, we can work with your account team, and we can get a uh, data link solutions architect to assist you with that process. Um, thank you again, everybody, for your time. And with that, I'll turn you back over to Danielle. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webcast. An on-demand version will be available within two to three days, and you will receive an email notification once the recording is available. Thanks again for participating in today's webcast.